this is going to be um, a double bill tonight with uh, myself and my colleague Ben Morris, who's a senior data scientist at Projecting Success. And we're actually going to be talking about a data driven approach to prioritizing your precious procurement effort. We've actually got 64 people on the call now, so I think numbers are a bit down, which is a little bit of a shame. I, I wonder if people are making the most of the, uh, the government scheme to um, eat out and help out. And people are getting their three course meal for 99p from um, Weatherspoons. But um, please don't leave the call. Now I've just told you it's the last day. Please bear with us. It should be a really interesting um, presentation. And um, without any further ado, I will crack on. So why am I here? So four years ago, projecting success realized that project data wasn't being utilized. So just like Yoshi said, this is what all this is what this community is all about. So this exhaust plume of data that comes out of the back of our projects, so all of the all of the schedule data, all of the risk information, all of the um, health and safety data, all of the productivity data, all of the cost information, all of that is archived, maybe even deleted when projects end. And we found that there was a, a massive amount of insights that were lost. And uh, we could really refine this data and get, and get data driven insights out of it. So we founded the Project Data Analytics community. And now, as Yoshi said, we have over 6,000 members, which we're really proud of. We love to inspire people and upskill them. And we really think it's an area we can make a massive difference. If you look at the, the news over the last few years with Crossrail and HS2, this is exactly what we want to change and try and make uh, these projects uh, more efficient and, uh, and cheaper. So we're convinced it really will be transformational and there's a massive amount of uh, the work to be done here. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a mathematician by training. I have a PhD in applied mathematics. I actually um, spent a couple of years uh, lecturing at university before I swapped out of academia into, into industry and I joined uh, Projecting Success as a data scientist. And now I kind of straddle this data scientist, uh, data analyst, data engineer role. And my scope within the company um, spans a lot of things, anything from building and training predictive models to managing tech teams to delivering data analytics training. And about in about 20 minutes or so, I'll be handing over to my colleagues at Ben, hoping you're here. Would you just give yourself a, a quick introduction? Yeah, so I'm a data scientist um, for Projecting Success. Um, my background is statistics, so I did my master's in statistics. Um, I kind of work with a variety of tools, really, Python, Azure, Power BI, um, kind of cover the full stack, um, and I'm also a tutor for the um, Project Data Analyst apprenticeship. And yeah, like James said, you'll be hearing a little bit more from me in 20 minutes or so. Awesome, thank you, Ben. That's if they make it through my bit of the talk, I guess. They don't head off to, to Weatherspoons. Um, so just a quick warning, um, we are not procurement experts, uh, we, we are mathematicians and statisticians, so if we get bogged down in uh, some of the jargon tonight and uh, we don't necessarily use the correct terminology, we're sorry about that, uh, we apply ourselves to lots of different sort of sectors and lots of different areas in those sectors and this is just one of them, so we pick up as much knowledge as we can, but just a warning, we are not procurement experts. Uh, and also, as Martin pointed out at the beginning of the call, we've actually got uh, Adil on the call and he's, um, he was working with us when we actually developed uh, lots of this uh, capability. So Adil has definitely deserves some of the credit um, and hopefully he's, he's going to enjoy what we're going to talk about tonight as well. So some of the terminology. Um, you, you've probably heard these terms kicked around and I thought it's useful to kind of get this thing out out of the way so to make sure we don't confuse you anymore. So artificial intelligence or AI, this is the kind of parent term that encompasses any of the techniques that allow a machine to act like a human. So think of your kind of iRobot um, sort of example. And then below that subcategory, you have machine learning. So this is an AI technique that focuses on learning from experience. So this is your more kind of traditional uh, classification problem or maybe using a reinforcement learning algorithm to train a car to drive on the road. Uh, and then finally below that, so it's a subset of ML, you actually have uh, deep learning. So this is um, where we use neural networks to actually kind of reproduce how the brain actually learns. And then we train models using, them, um, using these kind of uh, neural networks. So a bit of a schedule for today. So we're gonna cover these six things. 
So I'm actually going to start off by giving an overview of the current sector uh, and some of the issues. I'm going to talk about there might there being a slightly better way, a more robust data driven way, as you might expect. I'm going to talk about the data that's actually out there and how you can get your hands on it. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, I guess, the proposed solution. And then this is where Ben will take over and talk about the solution that, um, uh, that we've actually got today. Um, and then we'll give a bit of an example. Uh, and then finally, we'll both kind of handle um, some of the issues we came across. So um, starting off with the current sector issues, tendering and bidding is, of course, an integral part of the construction industry for procuring building contracts. So the building uh, process in construction is notoriously long, arduous and extremely risky. And I always remember um, this quote that one of our clients um, uh, mentioned in a conversation at some point that if you make one mistake pricing a job, even on a relatively small works package, then you can lose a huge sum of money. And I think that just goes to show how important it is when you're bidding to, to make sure the information that, that goes into your bid is accurate. So why is it so um, problematic? Why is this process so difficult? I guess clients typically select the lowest compliant bid. So any bid that's compliant with the, um, the request for proposal that, that has the lowest cost will generally be selected. Now, there are uh, multiple stages in the tender process which do alleviate some of these problems. So maybe cost won't be included at the beginning and it'll only be brought into a later stage. And this does fix some of the problems, but not, not all of them. But generally, um, some of these processes encourage people to bid as low as they possibly can and you end up with a bit of a race to the bottom and I'll talk about some of the problems that that, um, that encourages later on. Also there might be a lack of information um, in the request for proposal or the RFP so people if something's left out then certain companies will cut corners others won't their costs will be different and then um, this causes issues so that the, the wrong company might be selected for the job um, all sorts of issues can be caused um, from missing information. We've obviously all heard of Carillion, and there are two, um, two kind of blogs, articles that were being thrown around quite a lot uh, at the time where Carillion went under. And that was Carillion's um, private failure is actually a public problem and uh, do not end outsourcing because of Carillion. So Carillion's strategy really um, dealing with the, I guess the slowdown uh, in that sector was to, was to conceal all of its cash flow problem, problems by under um, bidding other firms at completely undeliverable prices. This obviously had a massive knock-on effect with the rest of the sector. Lots of other construction companies missed out on um, procurement opportunities that they, they probably should have won uh, and it, it, it ultimately affected their profitability a lot as well. So this race to the bottom um, not only sent Carillion under, but also had a huge knock-on effect to the rest of the sector. Uh, one of the other sector issues is um, construction has low margins, and I mean extremely low. So this uh, way, way lower than other sectors, kind of ridiculously low. This was um, a couple of years ago, I think. My eyes aren't deceiving me. Uh, that the top um, ten contractors. Uh, under the cosh as margins slipped to less than 0.5%. I do believe they've gone up. I think they've they've trebled, believe it or not. So they're up to a very healthy 1.5% uh, uh, roughly. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, light up the chat if I'm wrong. It'd be interesting to know. Um, but the, the margins are absolutely minimal. And five years ago, um, a specialist consultant, Marketing Works, joined forces with the University of Reading, uh, so Professor Will Hughes, to learn more about the tendering habits of some of these uh, building companies. So they conducted a survey, really interesting survey actually, of 179 construction firms, 60 of which were main um, contractors, uh, and they highlighted a huge financial burden um, that the tendering habits uh, placed on those companies. So the research um, from the University of Reading found, uh, and they, they made this assumption that um, these contractors are winning one in every five projects. And to be honest, I'm not sure. I think as an average, that's probably that's probably not too bad, but I think some of the main contractors, their, uh, their sort of probability of success is more like one in three, maybe even one in two. Uh, again, 
uh, if you're allowed to light up the chat, that'd be really great to see what sort of um, uh, what your sort of opinion is on that if you're from this sort of sector. But they're spending up to sort of 22% of their operational turnover, which is if you if you kind of think about that for some of the main contractors, uh, this could be tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds that they're spending. And this and they're wasting an awful amount of it, awful lot of it, sort of four fifths, 80% of that is is just being uh, on unsuccessful bids. So if we could reduce those, uh, the amount of contracts they bid on, but they're still winning the same amount of contracts, then it's an excellent way of increasing these um, these ridiculously low margins that we see in construction. So I think there's a massive opportunity here. Maybe one of the biggest opportunities in constructions right now for increasing margins is, is fixing this, um, this procurement sort of system. I can, I'm not going to say problem, I'm going to say system. So, um, what do the contractors have to produce that's so difficult? And to be honest, this is a bit of a tangent. I'm going to just make sure I don't go off on the tangent for half an hour. But they have to develop the following. So they have to develop bills and quantities. They need to come up with very detailed schedules for, for all the work that needs to be completed. They need to create full sets of design, design drawings. And we can actually use analytics and machine learning to give better, more robust predictions uh, for some of these estimations. Now, this is not what we've done. Um, but this is really difficult for construction companies to do, very expensive, very time consuming, um, very, very difficult to do accurately as well. So we could use uh, analytics and machine learning in this area, but again, a bit of a tangent. Uh, and we'll come back to this, um, the idea of sort of predicting procurement. So in summary, construction companies have to choose which contracts they bid on very carefully because they're only winning one in five and it's 22 percent of their operational turnover if you get it wrong if you really, if you're if you're if you deviate from that ratio and i think most construction companies have this kind of golden ratio where it, whether it's one in three one in four one in five if you start to deviate from that it can kill a company and um I think from what I've seen in my sort of experience, the insights come from this, uh, this gut feel. So are we going to bid on this? Uh, yes or no comes from, uh, it does come from gut feel a lot, uh, which is ultimately somebody's experience. And I think there's absolutely a place for this. We, we can't get rid of that. We need to have that kind of gut feel and experience that sort of what makes us human. But can we represent that experience and ultimately our gut feel with data? And, and that's what we try to do with this project. So what data exists right now? Well, what can we get our hands on? So there's, uh, there's data from Glenigan. So the, you can see I took this screenshot just a few days ago, but they've got half a million live construction projects. There's um, an API that's successful for construction leads. Um, they advertise themselves as the most accurate and comprehensive construction sales leads in the UK and Ireland. Um, the data is really clean, really complete, really easy to work with, but it does come at a cost. Okay, so you, this is not open source information. It's actually, you know, quite a high cost. Um, you're paying for you're paying for that that really good service. Uh, and then there's Barber ABI. To be honest, it's very similar to Glenigan. Um, again, very clean. Um, and complete data. It's worth noting how they collect this information. So uh, Barber ABI uh, essentially have like big call centers and they call, um, they make calls to try and understand the, the sort of missing bits of information they've got about projects to understand the size of them, um, where they are. And um, this obviously leaves them slightly open to incorrect information. So if they're told something wrong and they can't back it up um, or necessarily they can't really justify the source, then, then it isn't a guarantee with this type of information that it's correct. So you always have to take information that's coming out of Barber and Glenigan with a pinch of salt, not necessarily factual. Uh, and then there are, there are much more kind of open source data sets. So um, data sets like um, TED, so Tenders Electronic Daily, and you can see on the right hand side, it's quite easy to navigate to um, data dumps that they've got on there. So these are CSV files. So uh, the contract award notices from 2006 all the way to 2018 uh, and just contract notices again from the same dates. 
Um, I've made it look pretty easy, to be honest, to collect this data. Um, probably a little bit too easy. It's not um, as trivial as going and downloading all of these. In fact, it was so difficult to get a holistic um, sort, of, sort of view of all this data that we made it into a hackathon challenge um, and still it wasn't solved perfectly. So the data is pretty unclean. Um, it's got pretty low completeness. Um, there are other data sources on there as well, which I haven't mentioned, like XML and JSON files. These data sources have certain fields that aren't contained in the CSVs. The CSVs have certain fields that aren't contained in the JSON or the XML. So you need to do integration. There is missing years. Um, it becomes just trying to integrate this data set alone is um, it can be a bit of a nightmare. So um, I guess that's what you pay for with Barbara and Glenn again is the fact that it is so um, so organized and so easy to work with. Um, but there, there, are, there are ways of extracting you know useful data sets, but you need to put um, you need to put the time in and make sure you're very organized when you do the integration so that you don't miss out on information because it's very, very easy to do. Um, Contracts Finder. This is um, this is a government um, a web page that you can um, you can actually go and look at yourself. So Contracts Finder uh, lets you search for information about contracts worth over ten thousand uh, pounds with the government and its agencies. And I think I just saw the chat uh, get posted with that link. So thank you very much for that. Um, you can actually there's an API. So there are various APIs with um, with Contracts Finder, and this is just one of the ones that I've pulled off to. To experiment and show you with show you this evening um, but if you execute this endpoint in your browser so hopefully it is that one in the chat if you want to take a copy of that uh, and just paste it into your browser and hit enter then um, you need to make sure that you, uh, you append to that link on screen with the year month and day information include the zeros and then you actually get back a csv file so it just downloads that straight to your machine and that's all the notices for that day so you can't take these as a, as, a, as a one big data dump, which is quite frustrating. But what we can do is that we can solve this uh, Pythonically. So if we actually create a list of all the days we're interested in, so here we're working from January 1st, 2019, then we take uh, January 2nd, 2019, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to our desired date. We created a list of all of those, it's just as strings. And then we use requests in Python to, um, to iterate through that list and pull down those CSV files. So we could we could uh, almost immediately within just a sort of a few minutes, create a, a giant dump of these CSV files. Then we could of course concatenate them using something like pandas in Python and create um, a pretty holistic uh, data set. And this is just a, I did this on the 7th of August. Um, you can see that I, I quite quickly pulled off 1,660 files uh, this was a few hundred thousand, uh, if not uh, maybe even more than a million rows of data. And that's coming from a government API. The government data, generally speaking, is pretty clean, pretty complete. Um, and in this case, quite easy to access if, you, if you've got the sort of right tools at your fingertips. So uh, a bit more data that exists. So moving away from sort of, sort of contractual type um, data, we can use things like Twitter. So if you imagine um, that Kia, for example, are hiring a new employee from Balfour Beatty, they might be poaching their CTO, um, or maybe a construction company has an operation of slowdown because their site's just been flooded or they've lost some power. They might put that on Twitter. They might be trying to build up their public reputation um, and they might be kind of advertising that kind of thing. So again, Twitter has APIs. You can easily pull down that information for, for certain contractors that you're interested in and build a, a data set uh, on it. Again, there are things like construction news. So this gives uh, really much more broad, I guess, than Twitter sort of news. Uh, again, it's very reliable. Um, and uh, this could be anything from, I don't know, um, I think the, the article there is about uh, supply chain issues um, or maybe even informing you on um, what your competitors are doing and their uh, sort of procurement status. So maybe they've won a new contract and Barbara and Glendigan don't even know yet, but you could find out from construction news. And then uh, finally, you can see some tabular information there. So this is uh, construction industry um, company league tables. So this gives you data on 
um, sort of sector dominance. So you've got 50 construction contractors in a month, 50 construction contractors in a year, 50 clients in a month, 50 clients in a year. And they, this data is aggregated data from, from Glenigan, I believe. So it's not the, it's not the row, it's not the actual, the raw data coming from Glenigan, but it's aggregated. And it gives you an idea of, of who, who's winning the most deals, who's really dominant in a, in a particular sector. So I guess one of the problems is all of those things I've just mentioned. So all of the contracts from all the different sources. So the Glenigan, the Barber, the Contracts Finder, uh, the TED, um, just merging those is hard enough. By the time you build in things like the news, um, the social media, the sector dominance, it is a really, really difficult um, thing to get a holistic sort of unified view of that data. And you can only really do it by um, spending a lot of time of building uh, a data model. And I think the way to start off is start off simple. So start off with uh, some sort of basic contractual information, uh, build in another source, build in another source, work out how you can pull the news in. And how do you algorithmically decide um, if a, a piece of news that's one week old is still relevant? to a company. As humans, we can do that. We can say that, okay, Balfour BT is still running hot because we know that they've just won this contract that's gonna last for this long, or they've, they've been delayed because something saw on Twitter. Um, but how do, you, how do you build that into a model? And we're starting to, to make really good progress with it, um, how to get a computer to understand these things, but it is extremely, extremely tricky. And, uh, and here's the model for uh, some of the data um, some of the holistic view that we were trying to pull together with this data. So, um, I guess we've talked a bit about sector issues and I want to really bring this back uh, and break this down into a problem statement which we can try and solve. So the problem statement is, as a director, I want to know which jobs I'm more likely to win so I don't waste time or of course money on bidding jobs that I have little to no chance of winning. And with that problem statement, we came up with these two things we wanted to produce. So we wanted to produce a machine learning model that gave us predictions. And we could, that, that wasn't enough on its own. You couldn't just have a model that, uh, that, that had a prediction that spat out the back of it. It would have uh, no confidence for the user. So we needed to, to develop sort of a set of analytics, like a hub that, would give, um, give the user confidence so that when that machine learning model makes that prediction, then the user can actually justify that decision with all of the analytics. So this hub has about 50 to 60 different things in it, which Ben, I think is gonna talk about in a little bit more detail later on, um, but it covers things like contract to churn, um, maybe the relevant news. So if the model says that uh, four companies have a, a really high likelihood of winning it, then you could pull up the news very quickly and have a look at that. Um, the contractor win rates, so how much has a, a certain contractor been winning versus a sort of another contractor. We could look up the sector dominance information very quickly. Um, framework data, this is another whole talk on its own, to be honest, probably spend an hour talking about this on its own, but we spent a significant amount of time in the company pulling on um, freedom of information requests and getting framework data. So we've actually got scores on um, health and safety, uh, sustainability, cost, um, on lots of different companies. Of course, these are all um, uh, public uh, public data sets that, that we had to get through Freedom of Information. And again, that was built into sort of analytics side of things uh, to support the prediction of the model. Uh, and then we could go on and on and on. Just to interrupt, Jane, again, ben, lots of questions come in. Come on, for those now. Um, so we had a question here and it was, how might collecting estimations from stakeholders for bids be sped up? Numerical data is good, but I think there might be gains in communication strategy. Which modeling might be possibly employed in this instance? Say that one again, Yoshi, sorry. So how might collecting estimations from stakeholders for bids be sped up? Numerical data is good, but I think there might be gains in communication strategies which modeling might be possibly employed in this instance? Not really sure how to answer that one, to be honest. Um, 
maybe whoever's asked that question could clarify it for me a little bit. I think they had to okay. run at, at 10 past seven. Um, I do have another question for you, James, that I've come, that's come in. Sorry, that's a terrible answer. I'm not really sure I understand the question fully. Okay, no problem. Yeah, uh, fire question. in A with another one and we'll see if we have a bit more luck. Yep. Um, does the situation in construction only highlight that LPTA is not fit for purpose? This is especially true when tier one contractors lay off risks onto subs who may not be best placed to manage them. I don't really think I'm qualified to answer that. Um, I haven't been involved in construction for long enough, certainly haven't been involved in procurement. It does seem like the bidding process um, has its quirks, I'm not gonna say flaws. Um, and it could be, I think methods like this will be so disruptive to that system and make it look um, kind of archaic. And I think they'll kind of flip it, flip it right on its head, really. Excellent. Cool. Going to the previous question, James. So the previous question was about uh, collecting estimations from stakeholders. Um, I think that's a multifaceted sort of answer, really. So the first one is, do you still need the estimations from stakeholders if you've got a big enough data set that says you can get close in terms of the estimate? What you also need to do as well from the data is to understand the variance between your estimates and the outturn, which is what a lot of contractors aren't actually going back and revisiting. So you put an estimate in, you make gains on it, you have compensation events, you have loads and loads of things off the back of that data. And we don't necessarily go back and resolve that and close that loop for future estimates. So I think it's a combination of uh, leveraging that data and start to use that to shape your future estimates and secondly i do believe there's things like apps for instance and you can create your own apps or you can go and buy them uh, where you can start to plug into your supply chain and start to get some of this data a lot lot quicker and that's something we're trying to do through things like the construction data trust as well is to democratize some of these apps everybody's working with the same apps and sort of very similar data sources which means that things go a lot lot quicker and the data becomes a lot more reliable as well. So we have the increased data volumes. Is that helpful? Helpful for me. I think I understand the question now. Thank you, Martin. No problem. Did you say that person's left, Yoshi? Yeah, I think they left at 10 past, but um, when? that's cool. Cool. Any more questions or shall I push on for the time being? Uh, you can push on for now, James. Perfect. So the solution we proposed um, was to, uh, to build this model and train it on the contract data that we had. So some of the features were things like size, location of the project, um, the materials that we used on the project, the type of project, the client, and many, many more. Um, and we also wanted to uh, pump in things like the client news, the contractor news, anything that came out of Twitter. Uh, this, this bit is still a work in progress. We have managed to to build in certain things like the Twitter information, uh, but I think there's still a lot of insights to leverage from um, from the second uh, news box here, to be honest. So the model itself, uh, once it's trained, we then we feed in um, some new uh, contract data. So we'd have to extract the features and just how we did with the training, uh, we'd, we'd pump in the news data as well. Again, we'd have to extract the features in just the same way that's fed to the model and then out the back of that we have the prediction. And now something that's really um, kind of struck me midway through this project is that are we really doing this in, in the correct way? Can we flip this on its head? So if we're just applying this to the five contracts that are interesting to us and then we're getting that to support our gut feel, is that the right thing to do? Why don't we apply this to every opportunity out there and get the model to rank them for us. So, and then we can compare that with, um, with this five that we've already shortlisted using our gut feel, and we'll see if they're the same. And if they're not, then we've got the analytics uh, dashboard to go and um, investigate exactly why there's disparity there. And I think once that occurred to me, I thought that, that this could be really disruptive in the market. And then also something else that, that um, I guess really sort of turns this on its head is what about other sectors? So obviously we've applied this to construction and that's because a lot of our clients are in construction and um, it's quite easy to get 
I'm going to say is possible actually to get data. But what if we apply this to other sectors like major IT projects, for example, I've got some good data on that. Um, but we might need slightly more data. I think this, this sort of thinking is applicable to so many different sectors um, and, and there'll be disruption in, in all of them. And that is everything for me for the time being. And I'll hand over to my trusty colleague, Ben Morris, who's gonna walk us through um, some of the solution. Cool, yeah, thank you, James. Um, do you wanna to jump to the next slide and I will get started? Sure. Um, so, so as James has explained, the, the problem we were trying to solve was effectively, um, can we use existing contract, contract data um, to predict the outcome of future bids? So can we predict the main contractor of future bids? Um, and in terms of the data we were using, um, it was a, a data set of roughly 10,000 contracts, um, all from the construction industry of historical contracts. Um, and so in terms of the, the process at uh, quite a sort of high level, um, we extracted all these contracts um, from a couple of different sources. Um, we processed this data into a more structured form. Uh, we cleaned the data. We, we did some sort of exploratory analysis, um, created some new features for the data, um, and then applied some modeling on that data. Um, and I'll kind of go through, go through each step in a little bit more detail and the, the issues we had at each phase. And, and where we had problems um, and, and how we'd like to, I guess, improve the process um, going into the future. Um, if you could jump to the next slide, James. Thank you. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of data extraction, um, this was obviously the first step of the model. Um, we wanted to gather as, I guess, as many historical contracts as we could um, in order to be able to generate um, meaningful insights. Um, and James has obviously touched on the, the data already and the quality of the data. Um, obviously, there's, there's publicly available contract data. So we've got TED, um, Contracts Finder, um, many other sources. Um, although, obviously, there's sort of problems with this data, so it can be quite inconsistent. Um, we can have lots of missing fields. Um, and, and again, like James mentioned, it's very hard to extract. Um, the other option is the sort of paid for services. So Barber ABI, um, Glenigan, um, and I guess this using these sources obviously deals with the quality issue. Like the data is a lot, a lot better quality. There's less missing data. Um, but again, there's obviously quite a few costs involved with, with, um, with using this data, um, and also potentially restrictions around what you can actually use the data for. So, um, obviously there's some, some stuff to be looked into there. Um, but in terms of what we did, so um, we used a combination of a couple of different sources um, to extract this data. So, so we downloaded a, um, a, just an Excel file of the contract IDs for each year. Um, so as James showed a screenshot from uh, Ted earlier, so you can manually download um, basically a list of all the contract IDs for that year. Um, so we can use Python to kind of concatenate this list into a, a kind of master list of contracts that we're we want to extract information for. Um, and we can then navigate to the web page containing data from each of these contracts. Um, so the, the URL, the web URL has, has the contract ID in it. So we can use this list of IDs to open the web page for each contract. Um, we can scrape this data um, in a text form and, and then we can save it to a text file. Um, and obviously we end up with a collection of, of text files, one for each each sort of contract um, that we, we've scraped. Um, and if you jump to the next slide, James, thank you. Um, just a couple of, of sort of, I guess, warnings or issues we faced. Um, obviously we were, we were web scraping this data. Um, it, was, it was publicly available, the data we were scraping, um, but being on the web, there's a few sort of issues that we, we had to deal with. So obviously websites don't necessarily like web scraping. Um, when you're sending sort of web requests like several a second, it can it can really slow down websites. Um, and they can block you. Um, so obviously there's some some sort of ethical data scraping issues to contend with, whether you sort of throttle your scraping um, or that sort of thing. Um, and and issues like that kind of prevent us getting a larger data set um, and and did cause a few issues for us. Um, and then secondly is the issue, issue of duplication. So um, having data from multiple sources or even just a single source, um, obviously as new contracts come in, you want to sort of update your data set. 
um, but there's obviously always the potential for duplication. So um, it was quite important to keep a good a good log of the contracts we'd scraped um, and the ones we hadn't, so that we weren't sort of duplicating effort um, and rescraping data that we already had. Um, do you want to jump to the next slide, James? Thank you. Um, so after we'd extracted this data set, we were effectively left with um, all these text files containing text data of um, of these contracts. Obviously, we can't do a massive amount with that text data. Um, we need to sort of process it into a more structured form, um, and ideally a sort of CSV file of of each row being um, consisting of attributes in each contract. Um, so again, this was something we did with Python. So we'd read in each text file um, as a sort of list of lines. We, we had a set of attributes we wanted to look for in the data. So, so contractor, client, um, contract value. Um, we'd search for these in each line of the text file. Um, and we'd obviously add these attributes to our um, structured data as we went through. Um, because of the quality of the data, we obviously had issues with a lot of missing data. Um, so this was all kind of converted to null values. So there was, um, there was a large quantity of missing data, which I guess is the, um, well, yeah, one of the, one of the difficulties of working with this sort of data. Um, and then after we sort of had a structured data set, obviously the next stage is cl actually cleaning the data. Um, so two of the, two of the areas where, where we had a lot of issues and, and this is probably no different to, to any other sort of data set is, um, dates and value data. So obviously dates, um, they're sort of different formats. Is it, is it typed out? So, so January, 2018, um, is it a numerical date format? Is, is the year two numbers or four numbers? Um, obviously it was something we needed to kind of standardize. So we had a single, um, a single date format and then for, for value contract value as well. Um, it's quite a similar issue. Um, does the does the field contain the currency? Is there an, an M for million, or is it um, is it the full number? Um, and again, that was that was something we had to sort of standardise as we went through. Um, and then the final, obviously, there were other sort of uh, uh, parts of the data we had to clean. Um, but the the other sort of main main part, um, if you just go back a second, James, sorry. Um, there's two. See those all those lists of. Um, Kia. So we had to sort of re remap um, both with categories and contractors. Um, so there were, I think, maybe 30 different um, names for Kia in the data set. So obviously they're different sort of regional offices, um, they're different services, so Kia Highways, Kia Rail, etc. Um, so we had to sort of remap this data. So um, I guess to prevent sort of um, to prevent us working with a, a huge number of contractors when when in reality it all kind of comes under Kia. So that was another issue that we had to we had to sort of deal with with the data. Um, and now that we've we've got a processed and and cleaner data set, we we sort of move on to I guess the more exciting part of um, feature creation. So in terms of feature creation, we can start to um, can start to plot some of the data. We can start to do a bit of exploratory data analysis. Um, we can start to understand what um, we'll start to understand the features of the data. So, sort of things we look for is is the shape of the data, the spread of the data. Um, is there any correlation between different attributes? Um, just to get a feel for the data we're working with, really. Um, and this becomes more important when we move on to the modeling, um, as certain models kind of have certain assumptions. So this this sort of exploratory data analysis step allows us to, to assess if the, the data that we're using, that we're working with meets those assumptions. Um, and then in terms of actual, actual feature creation, um, there wasn't, um, I guess there wasn't loads of sort of additional features we added into the model um, and a lot of them were fairly simplistic. So sort of number of bidders, um, number of subcontractors, that sort of thing. Um, some of the more interesting features were were things like the number of um, the number of contracts that that client had already awarded to a single contractor. So um, potentially, when a when a single client has worked with that contractor many times before, then then they're probably going to be quite comfortable working with them again. Um, so so some of the features um, or metrics a little bit more a little bit more like that were were slightly more interesting to look at. Um, but I guess there wasn't a like the loyalty aspect of it really. Yeah, yeah, and I guess that comes on to um, like supplier churn and that sort of thing as well. Um, but yeah, so that was that was kind of um, that was the feature creation part. 
um, and then we can obviously move on to actually modeling the data. So um, firstly, we have to prepare the data. We've, we've got a clean data set. We've got our features. Um, it's in a structured form. Um, so we sort of shuffle the data to remove any, any sort of bias um, with regards to the order of the data. Um, if it's ordered like alphabetically or in date order or anything like that, um, we obviously shuffle the data to remove that. Um, we split it so we have our training data that we we fit our model on um, and then our testing and validation data where we can we can sort of assess our um, assess our model performance and, and compare the results um, and then we come on to to the model selection um, which is probably i guess one of the most important parts of the of the whole process um, and this is where our exploratory analysis kind of comes in quite um, quite useful um, so obviously Obviously, model selection is really important. Um, we need a model that we can interpret. So we want to be able to understand, rather than just getting a prediction, we want to be able to understand why that prediction has been made. So um, what sort of features are, are particularly important in our model um, making that prediction um, and just understanding why it's predicting the, the contractor it is predicting. Um, and then the second point I made there is just the suitability of the model. So um, in terms of our data sets, the size of our data set, the dimensionality, so um, how, many, how many attributes we've got in our data, um, certain models are, are more suited to others. Um, I mentioned earlier about like correlation. So if we've got um, correlated data, then that's probably less suited to certain model types. Um, if we've got a lot of missing values, that, that again, um, can affect the model that we choose. So that's why the, the exploratory analysis part is so important. Um, in the end, for, for I guess a number of reasons, so interpretability, the fact we didn't have a huge data set, um, it wasn't particularly high dimensional, um, the actual data we were working with. Um, so we kind of fitted um, general um, supervised classification models. So there were about four or five different models we we chose to fit our data on to kind of assess their performance and um, and compare the differences between them. Um, and in terms of of the accuracy of the model, so so we managed to predict um, to predict a bid outcome to an accuracy of around sort of thirty percent. Um, and in certain cases, this increased to to about fifty percent. And when I when I say sort of in certain cases, um, this was. Um, where we had access to greater data for that, either that client or that contractor. So we were more, I guess, more certain of, um, or, or had, a, had a better idea of, of who would win that um, contract. Um, that 50% figure came from um, contracts by Network Rail. Um, so they sort of had a more constrained supply pool. Um, there were less suppliers bidding for those contracts. Um, and then when we move on to um, looking at the accuracy for the top five contractors, our, our accuracy obviously moves up to sort of 65 to 75%. So we weren't every time just looking um, at the winning contractor of a project. Um, we, were, we were looking at sort of the top three or top five. So what, what accuracy can we predict that a contractor will be in that top three or top five? Um, and from there, we can kind of assess the, the potential, I guess, rivals to, to winning a bid. Um, if, if your company is one of those top five, then um, who are your competitors and, and how you compare to those competitors. So um, it wasn't just, just a single accuracy of, of the main competitor, of the main contractor, sorry. It was, um, it, we looked a bit, bit wider than that. Um, and then the, the final point I've made on this slide is that um, we obviously anticipate this, this accuracy could increase um, as we sort of build in extra parts to the model. So. As James mentioned, at the moment, we're only working with contract data. Um, and I guess the data due to the source we've kind of got it from is, is fairly limited in terms of size and, and quality. So um, any, any sort of methods we could use to increase the volume and quality of the data as well would, um, I guess, would drive performance further. Um, and now we've got a couple of examples of, um, or an example of, I guess, a single project. So this was, um, this was a new build at the University of Sheffield. Um, so, so the contracts obviously, um, obviously gone out for tender. So we would, um, if we were to kind of run the model on that um, contract, we'd follow all the steps as, as above. So we'd extract that data, we'd um, process it into a structured form, we'd clean it, we'd create the features, 
um, and then we'd run it through our trained model. Um, and so just, just as an example, this, um, this contract from the University of Sheffield, um, on this slide here, we've got the most likely winner of this, um, this opportunity, which I can't actually read, but I think is Henry Construction. I think it um, is, yeah. Although it's quite small. So, so we can see, for example, for this, um, Henry Construction have a, have a probability of winning of, of 48%. Um, the main competitors to them for this bid, um, you obviously there, see there are, are Kia, Wilmot and Interserve and, and we can start to look at their, their relative probabilities of winning um, and how that compares to your, um, your winning probability. Um, and then, then the final point on this slide is just what, what insights can I get to enhance my P-win, which is something um, we'll come on to in the second. And this is where we start to, I guess, see the real benefits. So at the moment, we're kind of at the stage where you can see your probability of winning and, and the competitors, um, but it's how you can sort of enhance your, your score is where the benefits really come. Um, and we'll go on to that a little bit more in a second. Um, in terms of bolt-ons, so I guess, um, like how can we extend this model? We've obviously got a, a prediction model to predict the main contractor, which is um, useful to an extent, but obviously there's, there's a lot further this can be taken. Um, so how can we sort of create a tool that um, bid teams and procurement teams can use to, to sort of assist them with the whole procurement um, process. Um, and then going back to, to one of James's slides, so obviously at the moment, this is kind of part one, the model. Um, and then as we build in, build in different data sources, we start to get a more holistic picture. Um, so we mentioned construction news before, so um, we can start looking at sort of some market analysis using using the league tables, using the latest construction um, or, or news in the construction industry. Um, it can allow you to sort of look at, um, look at the profile of your company, where you sit in the market, um, compare yourself to competitors. Um, and obviously as you combine that with, um, with the predicted probabilities for a bid, you can look at where you sit compared to those competitors around you. Um, there's also, um, we mentioned Twitter data. So there's Twitter have an API. You can register for a, a developer account and get your, your um, Twitter API um, authentication details and you can run that API and extract tweets. Um, this was something we did to sort of perform some sentiment analysis on tweets about these, um, about these contractors. Um, and again, that's something I'll touch on again in a minute. Um, Moving on to, to the next slide. So I guess the final sort of source of data that we used um, in this solution as a whole was this framework data that James has mentioned. Um, and I'll keep it, I guess, fairly brief because we could talk about this quite a lot. Um, but so we put in a number of FOI requests to get um, two different public bodies to kind of um, get bid feedback data or bid score data from historical contracts. Um, so obviously the actual process of submitting these FOI requests is a very manual job. Um, it's, I mean, Martin, Martin was, um, Martin was doing a lot of it and I'm sure he'll tell you how, how difficult it was and frustrating it was. Um, but I guess it involved just sending off a lot of emails and, and requests for information. Um, and then the FOI requests that we did or the responses that we did receive, um, also, I guess, caused us further issues. So, so the data we received was in a lot of different formats. Um, we get some Excel files, some PDFs, some Word documents. Um, so it was quite hard to kind of process them automatically. It was a very manual job. Um, and secondly, was the fact that these, um, I guess, contract awarding, um, I guess, clients effectively, but public clients, um, all use different taxonomies for the contracts that they awarded in terms of um, the categories that they scored these clients. So um, some of them only scored um, contractors against five criteria. Um, others scored, scored them against as many as sort of 20 criteria. So we had to sort of develop a, um, a sort of master taxonomy of these bid scores to be able to, um, to be able to sort of stand, standardize the scores between different um, different clients and different contractors. Um, so we sort of created a holistic mapping um, of these scores, but obviously again, this was a really manual task. Um, the data was really useful, but um, for the effort we put in, I guess we got a, uh, we've, we've got a fairly small um, 
data set. So this is something I guess we'd really like to improve um, in the future. Um, and I guess hopefully make the whole process a bit more efficient. Um, and the, the, I guess the other, sorry, just one more issue with the, with the FOI request was just the time that it takes to get a response. So I think it's 20 days that they legally have to respond to the request, but often this response wasn't data. It was a, um, you can't have that data. And then Martin would go back and tell them that he could have that data and why. And it, it, it took quite a while, didn't it, Martin? <laughs> It took us about two years end to end to go to court and then finally win. But we've set the precedent now is that this bid feedback data, there is a public need to get hold of it. So we've established that now. Um, it needs to go to the higher court to be sort of precedent, but we have established that. So that means now if we want more and more of this data, I can quote that back. And I think that some of these uh, public bodies have backed you off because they think you're not serious about it. And because we've been to court and we've won, they tend to roll over a bit easier now getting hold of this data. Uh, plus, Michael Gove has now said a lot of this data needs to be in the private sector. So I think we'll start to see this really turning soon. So if you get the bid feedback data, it's not just the winner. You get a breakdown of the questions as well. So you know somebody's a sustainability score or a health and safety score or something other score. And then you can look at the variance. And I think this is Ben's next slide. But it took yeah. us two years, a huge amount of effort. But... That's something that we're about as a company. We're campaigners trying to change the way we think about project data analytics. And project data analytics is not just about project management. It's the full life cycle in terms of project delivery, all the way from bids through to delivery. So over to you, Ben. Thank you. Cheers, Martin. Um, Questions coming in as well, James, if you want to pick those up. Do you want to do some questions? or um, Yoshi, are you collating the questions for me? Yes, can do. It can do. Yeah, do you want to fire a couple of them? Fire yeah. a couple of the questions. Coming, guys. Um, the first one was from um, Warren, and it is how do you remap internal changes of structure? Here are not alone in regularly moving the chairs around to suit their changing focus and demands of shareholders, customers, and strategic surgical shifts. So, how do you how do you remap internal changes of structure? Is that in terms of these these bid bid? Um the bid scoring questions, the remapping of that. The organisations, Ben. So those 30 organisations that you had for Kia. Oh, how did we do that? Their names, then what would you do about it? So uh, I guess initially it was quite manual. Um, we automated it as much as we could. For example, for Kia, you can, the like the name Kia is in all of those like 35 different um different contractor names. Some of the others were a bit more difficult where we had sort of initials um, and full names of, um, of contractors. So, so the ones like Kia was, was fairly automated in the way we did it. Um, we'd just look for that, for that single word Kia um, and remap it. Um, but again, others were a lot more difficult and some of it was a manual, a manual task to do. Um, and we kind of had a master um, sort of remapping dictionary to, to map those. What a deal is, um, is sort of remembering all the headaches that we had um, when doing this because yeah. we went through various systems of, um, of trying to, I guess, make all of the naming conventions consistent. Um, and we, we went through, we sort of come up with a system and then we would ban backtrack because it wouldn't work for everything. So we, we sort of settled on this quite rudimentary brute force system. Um, that that needed um, updating uh, all the time, um, but we managed to automate quite a lot of it, so it wasn't too painful in the end. Any other questions, Joshi? Warren just pointed out. My point is, it changes regularly, as do reporting lines, contacts, focus, all of which influence future probability of bid success. Yeah, so we, we would need to do it every time we train the model. Absolutely. Okay. Um, another question we have um, from Perry. May we know many, may we know many features, may we know many features are selected from the data and what type of the test data we need to use? Can we know what type of model was used? So in terms of features, is that sort of the, the most predictive features of the model, um, I, I assume? So, so the, I guess the two um, most predictive features of our model were, were client and then the number of um, previous contracts at that 
um, client had awarded to that contractor. So I guess sort of loyalty in a way. Um, they were the most sort of predictive features. Um, and then in terms of the model we used, so we used a we used a number of classification models. Um, so we used logistic regression, um, a support vector machine, um, naive Bayes model. Um, the logistic regression was the most the most accurate model. So that I guess that was our our sort of final model. But but yeah, we trained it on a few a few different models to to understand the difference in accuracy between them. In terms of those features as well, Ben, I think it's worth mentioning about if you've got lots of data and you're trying to segment that data. So if somebody's talking about roads or roundabouts or whatever, you're looking for features in that data that then pulls out that cluster in. So when you mentioned it before, there's about a thousand different features which you and Adil have pulled out from that overall data set. So I think it's worth worth touching on that as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I fully understand what you're getting at, Martin. Sorry. So in terms of the features, it's the derived features that you got from the models. It's not just the um, basic features in terms of those parameters in the data set. So you derived a lot of other features on top uh, yeah. from the machine learning coming out of that data set. So the feature, the feature creation was the really exciting bit of the project. That's the really like creative um, sort of analysis aspect where you uh, you kind of sit around in a team and you think, you know, what is going to be uh, of all these features we've got, all these kind of uh, natural features in the data. Which ones can we create using feature creation that will be that might potentially be predictive? And then you make your plots you can see that you were completely wrong with that one and then you go back to the drawing board and try and find something else um, and that's where you can you know that's where you really get a lot of of benefit from um from the data and where you get all the predictive nature in the data cool. just two more questions guys um another question was did you evaluate any contract price award values for the successful bidder with their final account value and compare this to the unsuccessful bidder's price so we only had, go on Ben, you can answer that if you want. Well, so I was going to say, so in the contract data, no, we didn't have, we didn't have access to that. Um, so no, that wasn't something we looked at. Um, but yeah, it, that would definitely be something that would be interesting to look at. But, um, Correct me if I'm wrong though, but in the FOI data, was, were they scored against price? Yeah, so we had, well, some of them were. So we had the price of, yeah, the winning and unsuccessful bidders. Um, but I don't know if we had access to final final value i don't know if we'd be able to get that well, we've got the contracted value so it's the con it's a value at contract award you don't get the price value of the uh unsuccessful bidders but you can derive it uh so we got quite good at deriving what those those sort of financial values were so we can then work out uh are people consistently bidding in a similar sort of range compared to your bid and this is all from publicly available sort of data, don't forget. So if we get data from one organization and build that into the model, it gets a lot, lot better. What we can't do is to build private data in from lots of companies into the model because that then gets into collusion. So we've got to be really, really careful what we do with some of this data and the model. But you can take the public data and build one organization's data into it. If you build another sort of organizations data it needs to be firewalled you can't machine learn from one to the other because it gets into collusion All right and one last question for you ben yeah when you produce data reports how do you choose to present your findings to clients self-service data analytics where clients may be able to put their own queries into ai software and the consultant helps with data interpretation where required guided data analytics where the consultant provided more detailed feedback or another method could you also provide some reasoning as to why you would prefer your chosen method over others? Um, so I think if I understand the question correctly, um, I guess it's a, a bit of a mix of the two, to be honest. I guess a lot of it depends on what the client wants. If they want some, some clients, are, I guess, pref like they're, they're very aware of what they want to see from their, their data reports and their dashboards, or they have existing data reports that they'd, they'd like replicating and enhancing a bit. Um, and I guess others are, are, are more starting from scratch and, mm -hmm. and 
yeah less sure of what they want so then i guess it's down to um sort of us to lead it in terms of what they want um yeah and if i could chime in there as well yeah um, go for it. we've actually done both so um i think some organizations are still set in the kind of i want to rep i want to report on that i want some uh, like a pdf that i can read through and and look at um you know all the statistics and metrics that have been calculated for me and actually i think um sort of those sort of self-serve uh, analytics are becoming more and more um sort of common in like that boardroom environment so we're moving away from that that sort of report based system but we, we've managed to do both ultimately it is it's a self-serve so it's there to support the user it's there to support the the predictions that it makes but there's no reason to say that that can't be you know um, that report can't be kind of tailored into uh, a more traditional uh, type report and, um, and because of that we have done both excellent thanks guys cool i will um i'll drop you on to the next slide ben yeah um so going back to the the foi data so this was just an example um these were just a series of box and whisker plots um for kind of each category that um of our master taxonomy of, of these bid scores so this is just for a single contractor um and obviously this is a very small sample um but there's i guess a few different areas that you can take these scores so um, firstly, to see, see where you're performing well and where you're not. So um, I guess maybe you're aware of the areas that your or your bid team are aware of the areas that they're performing well, um, but but maybe maybe not. And I guess this sort of data approach allows you to um, interpret that a little bit more. Um, there's another area where I think this first this top sort of red um, oval we can see there's a huge variance in the scores for. Um, What's that business resilience and continuity? So I guess the the categories where you've got that huge variance in scores, you'd want to you'd want to delve into it deeper and understand what that variance is caused by. Is it down to clients, um, I guess, just not being consistent in how they score you? Is it down to different bidding teams um, performing differently to each other? Um, just understanding what the differences are. And then I guess the third area where you can really use these scores is combined with the model. Um, when you start to look at your your main competitors for a particular contract, you can compare your your previous scores against their previous scores and see which areas that, that maybe you're, you're not performing as well or that you're performing better. Um, and I guess allow you to sort of target certain areas of your, of your bidding. Um, if you want to jump on to the next slide, I guess we're maybe running out of time a little bit. So if I go quite briefly over the next few slides. Um, so we've got this, I guess, is an example of this um, sort of analytics hub that James mentioned earlier. So um, a, a sort of concatenation of, of everything really. So, so for a single, um, a single new contract, um, we sort of look at, at the predicted winner, um, the major competitors, um, how they compare in terms of sort of their market status using that data from construction news. Um, and then we obviously start to build in the bid feedback data. So um, how the historical scores of each of these um, main competitors sort of compare to each other and, and where different companies have different, um, different advantages. Um, on the next couple of slides, we've just got examples of some dashboards that have kind of come out of this work. So, um, so the first one is is sector. So we started looking into wh which sectors suppliers were winning the most work, which suppliers were performing best in what, what sectors. Um, supplier churn. So do certain clients keep using the same suppliers? Um, obviously, some have, I, I assume, have preferred clients. Um, and obviously, this was one of the most predictive features in our model. So that, that kind of proved that. Um, and then a third one there on joint ventures. So which which suppliers have the greatest success of winning a joint venture, which sort of joint venture partners um, perform best or are most likely to win a contract together. Um, and then, then a final slide on some other dashboards. So um, again, on the FOI requests sort of bid analysis. So um, against the criteria, what, where are your competitors better than you? Where are you better than them? Um, where do you need to improve? Um, a sort of KPI, KPI analysis, so um, which bidders have the most spread compared to the average, so how they're performing against the average scores. Um, and then finally, a, a box and whisker plot again there, just showing the distribution of um, 
oh sorry this one's showing successful and un unsuccessful scores so um you can see uh well you can't really see but the red dots show the unsuccessful scores and the blue dots show the su successful scores so you can kind of see what level the i guess the cutoff was of of getting onto that framework in in regards to scores and and compare yourself to that um and and yeah i guess take that learning into the future um in terms of of what's possible so i think we're we only start to sort of see this real value as we connect different sources of data so so the model in itself is is good but it becomes a lot more useful when we bring in this bid feedback data um, and the market analysis and and kind of connect it as a whole um, obviously this is where it gets more difficult um, trying to draw connections between this data um, and I guess there's there's the various improvements we'd like to make to our modeling so we'd obviously like to incorporate more of the market data um, the Twitter data um, incorporate that into our model and see if that kind of um, gives us any other improvements adding in the framework data that sort of thing um, so there's various sort of improvements to make in the future um, I think we've got a couple of slides on issues that we had um, so the first one was obviously around data so there was no API so this this caused a lot of headaches for us um, and obviously we created our sort of custom bot to scrape the web um, and obviously get this data in an unstructured format um, and then obviously had to pass this data into a structured form um, obviously this was sort of the major issue we faced there was no there was no major data export um, we could get there was no API to use so um, that made the sort of data collection and processing a lot more difficult um, I think on the next slide we've got a couple more issues so in terms of the bid scores um, there's no easy way to extract this data um, I don't know if there's ever going to be an easy way to extract this data because it's all so siloed it's in these separate organizations um, I guess if you looked at a contractor maybe the maybe contractors are collecting their own bid feedback scores I, I think they probably are so um, certainly for looking at an individual company there's there's maybe more analysis to do but as a sort of sector as a whole it's probably harder um, it took us a huge amount of effort just to collect the little data we did um, and, and clean it so um, yeah that was one of the major issues um, and then finally on the market data so there's only sort of so much we can understand from the news about different contractors so there's only likely to be be news about I guess winning a contract and there's only so much news that that exists really around around construction um, and then the final part was just on the Twitter data so um, I guess it wasn't particularly indicative of contract performance or bid performance um, the data we collected was both from these um, construction companies accounts and about them where they were mentioned in tweets um, but I guess construction companies are quite different to sort of more consumer companies and, and I guess sort of political organizations in that they don't the tweets about them aren't particularly emotive whereas you think about politics a lot of tweets around politics are very emotive so it's easy to track sentiment of that whereas if most tweets are, are sort of of a neutral sentiment then it's harder to sort of extract value from that um, and I'll pass back over to you James for some more issues so I guess with this slide um, I want to sort of cast imagine sort of casting your mind forward sort of 10 20 years when um, models like this have been adopted and uh, a lot of people are using them and the data that drives these things is much more available so the clients have access to it the contractors have access to it and, um, and we're going to talk about the sort of disruption that that might cause. So the first one could be a legal risk um, with the current sort of set of rules that we have. We would that would definitely be collusion. So right now, a company cannot say to another company, you know, just hold hold fire for the next one, um, because we're going to take that. And then you know what? We'll we'll um, you scratch our back and we'll scratch yours and we'll hold fire for the one after that. And um, that's definitely uh, quite naughty. Now let's say and um, and and cannot be done and if everybody's got these type of algorithms and everyone's using them then they'll all have they all could potentially have the same result and it makes collusion um, I'm not saying you know it, it's a solid it's a solid line it's definitely a blurry line uh, and algorithms like this make make the whole thing slightly unclear um, and can clients legally you know change the scoring mechanisms 
So right now they, they have a lot of uh, very strict rules of how they, how they score and you know, does this need to change? If they have access to this type of open data, um, then, then they don't need to, um, when organizations build their bids, then they don't need to, to reproduce all the information they do about their sustainability, their health and safety. The, um, the clients can see that. Uh, so it saves money for them and it makes it more transparent as well. So again, so I think that comes back actually quite nicely to one of the questions I was asked about, um, you know, what, what's going to change in the disruption that's going to occur. And I think this is, um, this, this is one of the really key points. Um, so using legacy data, um, what if a new contractor pops up? One of the slight problems with machine learning, and there are solutions to it, but we don't have one right now with this model. Um, a new contractor pops up, which is perfect for a job, but they're not a part of the model, so they're not even considered. Um, you know, that's one of the issues that, that we have to contend with. And this perception of blacklisting as well. So uh, what if somebody's not particularly suitable for, um, for a contract uh, and they're never coming up, it's difficult for them to sort of branch into that sector maybe, um, then what if it looks like they're never being um, selected as a, as a genuine uh, option, then that's also uh, sort of verging on collusion and, uh, and potentially illegal. So we've got to be careful of things like that. Ben's going to walk us quickly through um, some of the issues with data volumes. Yeah, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm clear. Cool. Um, so, yeah, in terms of data volumes, so um, the first point there, which I guess we've we've kind of already made. So obviously, there's a there is a limited performance with small data samples. Um, there's only so so much we can do with the small amount of data, and obviously, there's a lot of missing data, which which creates further issues. Um, to what extent are past results an indicator of, of future results? So obviously it is a rapidly changing sector. How, um, how much is past performance a predictor of future performance? Um, and I guess that's a, a fairly open question. There's no, there's no solid answer to that, but um, if, if past results aren't really indicative, then, then our model's not going to be much use. So, um, so I guess that's quite important. Um, and then the final two points there, so the collapse of key suppliers. So, um, something like Carillion going bust, um, how does that sort of change the market? Maybe they were, um, I don't know, a, a, a mark, I guess a, a bid leader in a certain sector. Um, how does that sort of shuffle the, the market if they collapse? Um, and then and then finally changing company strategies. So um, I guess you can look at strategy as a whole, but obviously uh, particularly in this sort of data-driven um, times, a lot of companies are, are transforming digitally very quickly. So. Um, a certain company is moving a lot quicker than others and therefore maybe their performance is going to start improving. Um, and, and it comes back to that second point, maybe past results aren't that indicative of future performance. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think some of the, uh, just to finish off this slide, some of the procurement risks um, involve uh, competition. So competition is obviously very important. Um, and if you've got sort of dominant suppliers in a particular construction type, then is the model going to, to reinforce that? And uh, ultimately will, comp will competition uh, dry up? And to what extent can legacy data shape the procurement decisions? I mean, can we capture everything in data? I've said about how hard it is to get a holistic view. I know, can we actually capture the news, um, all of the Twitter, all the social media, all of the contract information? Can we capture it and should we be capturing it um, with all of the legal and procurement risks that we've got that we've just mentioned? Um, and it, I guess maybe, maybe, maybe this is more of a benefit than a risk, but it gives us an opportunity to sort of challenge procurement decisions. Again, if you sort of cast your mind forward to all this data being open, being accessible to clients and contractors, then we can make bidding more transparent. We can get rid of this perception of blacklisting um, and, and we can see why somebody was selected. Everybody can see that it can be much more transparent uh, and money can be saved. So um, again, sort of uh, less of a risk, more of a, uh, I guess it's leaning on, leaning towards maybe collusion and you have to be careful of that. Um, but um, I think the market will be disrupted massively. And that brings me nicely onto my next slide. So we've said about how important it is for competition. And, you know, we need to have competition in the UK or we have with dominant suppliers, we end up with um, prices rising. So it's really important that we that we still keep 
uh, competition and, and that needs to be handled very, very carefully. And to, to what extent will actual performance and track record begin to feature? So again, if, if clients and, and contractors have, uh, have access to all this data, then all of their sustainability, all of their health and safety data, um, it doesn't need to go into their bids. They don't need to create that every time, um, again, to save them money, save them time and, and make it more, transpar more transparent for the sector. Uh, the third point there is it in our collective interest that companies are bidding for work that they have a very small probability of winning is this something that we should be doing um, even if it's our competitors wasting time wasting money wasting resources you know we're trying to increase productivity productivity by 10 times this is a uh, this is something we should all be doing and we shouldn't be wishing this even on our competitors um, and how does the law evolve um, you know i don't I don't want to use the B word, but if when we leave the EU uh, and the rules change, you know, what effect of this, how much freedom, how much flexibility are we going to have um, when it comes to um, the rules around um, procurement? And so I think that is, again, going to be very interesting and potentially quite disruptive. And can this help to encourage new methods of procurement? I think it will. I think things will change drastically. Um, I think the whole thing will be will be turned upside down. I think it will really stimulate innovation in the UK, not just in construction. Like I said, I think this type of approach can be applied to every sector. And um, and I think if we can get over the the, uh, the disruption and some of the risks that we saw on the previous slide, then I think um, this definitely definitely can be a good thing and uh, and should be good news for everyone. So I have um, my last Mentimeter slide. So if you haven't if you haven't fallen asleep, then um, I could encourage you please to, to go back to Mentimeter, um, and I will do the same thing. Um, and based on everything um, that Ben and I have just told you, how do you envisage that this will disrupt procurement? So one person says it will completely change it. That's four, four people that aren't asleep. Six people. That's really good nine people have responded we have dropped down to 47 participants so i think maybe sort of 15 or so people have decided to head off to witherspoon's bend instead of listening to us um do you blame them <laughs> <laughs> so it looks this looks positive so it looks like we have had an impact um moderate changes but most people saying it will completely change it um, nobody here saying no change which is um, really promising. I guess that's exactly what we were trying to achieve, show the power of these things. So that's really great. Right, so let me jump back to the slides. Ben, I don't know if it's you or me. Uh, you, I think. This one, how do you prepare and adapt? So um, I think it's really important. Things are going to be things are going to change so much in the next few years. Um, it's so important that we understand the art of the possible. Um, with this this meetup is all about upskilling. You know that's what we want to do. We want to encourage people to learn new things uh, and build their sort of collegiate networks. So it's important to upskill. You need to agree your strategy. So this is never going to. Um, if you want your organisation to change, this is probably you're going to struggle. To do this um, you know on your own you need to have you need to kind of upskill and go from the bottom or you need to get buy-in from the top um, otherwise your your progress is going to be is going to be really really blocked um, define all your challenges just like we did with this challenge where you know i clearly defined the problem statement and the use case um, you know you need to do that you need to develop a data model and do your gap analysis to make sure that you've got the right data to solve the problem one of the one of the main um, issues I see in data analytics at the moment in the project space is that people have data and they, they want to know what they can do with it. Again, you know, we need to reverse engineer that. We need to we need to find the problems and solve them, and then um, and then collect the data we need to solve those problems and not the reverse. Uh, develop and refine your data, and uh, and then once you've got your solution, you need to pilot it and refine it, improve it, and of course evolve. And uh, I believe that's um, that's that's one of the, the last uh, presentation slides. Um, we just want to I want to encourage you to please join us at a project hack. Hopefully, someone again to paste the link. Thank you very much. 
um, and spread the word about the meetup. You know, we've just we've just ticked over sixty thousand members, and like I said, we're we're super proud of that. Um, you know, we'd really like to hit ten thousand as soon as possible. Um, so it'd be very much appreciated if you could spread the word. Uh, here are my LinkedIn details. Again, hopefully I see the chat go ping. Um, there is a tiny URL there. So if you, um, not so much for you to remember or type in, if you want to just take a quick screenshot, hopefully it will go ping in the chat. And then um, uh, Ben's uh, LinkedIn as well. So everyone uh, in, the, in the call today would very much appreciate if you linked in with us, feel free to ask us any uh, ongoing questions and um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Superb. Thanks, Ben and James. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. We're looking to open the floor for any questions. So we did get a few questions in the in the chat, guys. Um, yeah, she, can I jump in and answer a couple quickly that I've just seen? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. So there was one from Ken on did you look at trends and did it improve over time, which I assume is about the, the bid feedback scores um no we didn't because we only had probably no more than sort of three three or four scores separate scores from each supplier so um in terms of trends over time there wasn't enough data to do that um again it would definitely be something interesting to do but um the data volumes just didn't <coughs> um and then i saw one from ricardo i think it is uh, uh, yeah not every contractor bids for every project we might have projects with a huge amount of bidders and others with just, just a couple of them. Um, this fact will bias the data used to train the model and consequently the prediction outputs. Was this considered? So um, yeah, some of our features that we created um, were around sort of the number of bidders. So um, yeah, that was taken into account. But yeah, it definitely would, would bias the, the prediction. Um, sorry, back to you, Yoshi. Excellent. Thanks, Ben. Um, guys, if you've got any more questions or you want to stay on to talk to James and Ben a bit more about what they've covered, um, just come off mute and, um, and just have a chat, really. Um, I'd like to mention that as well. Um, remember, we have two more meetups coming up. So the one on the 9th um, of September is with uh, Dev. So it's Dev's third time at the PDA meetups. Um, and it's always great having Dev to come and do his talk about MPLAN. And then we'll also have Martin doing a discussion as well um, the following meetup. Um, so, yeah, any questions? And take yourself off mute because I won't know unless you mute yourselves. Unmute yourselves even. Hi, Yoshi. Hello. Hello, it's Richard. Hi, Richard. Hi. Can I just ask, in terms of the data analysis has gone through there, um, uh, there's a lot of IT projects that um, go through government and um, the, the freedom of information asks that uh, you've been talking through. Uh, were there any data sources for the sort of IT industry type bidding and, and that information? Did you come across any of that in this work? Uh, I have come across, come across uh, that kind of data. Yeah, I think, to be honest, Richard, if I was going to do this again in, in another sector, that's exactly where I would go. Um, um, I, I came across some government data um, with major IT projects and there was, uh, it's pretty easy to get hold of and the data looks quite clean. So I think it's a, it's a natural application of this, this type of um, solution, to be honest. That's brilliant. Thanks, James. Um, I'll probably catch up with you after the meeting. Yeah, I can easily point you at that um, towards, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what it is. Um, oh, this American data as well, I'm sure, Richard, uh, UK and American data um, that I can point you in the direction of. Thanks, James. No worries. And thanks for the talk. Really good. Thanks. You're, you're more than welcome. Uh, hi, guys. This is Amol here. Hi, Amol. Hello. Hi. Hi. I uh, had a, put, in it, uh, put a question in the chat as well, but uh, I'm working as a consultant uh, in the supply chain sector, which uh, uh, we work within the retail and uh, construction and uh, also the rail sector. Now, we help our clients uh, uh, manage their contracts and manage their bid uh, through the bidding process as well to make sure that they are best positioned to get work. Now, when uh, we're trying to uh, make the sector comparisons, obviously benchmarking them against their competitors is always uh, a difficult task because of the data privacy issues. Now, this yes. particular model that you've talked about, I think discusses a lot of open source data. So would we be able to use uh, some of it uh, for uh, 
say a benchmarking exercise to say uh, their uh, a particular company's performance against their industry peers yeah i think so i think i think to be honest we've we've probably solved quite a big um, portion of that problem with the sort of analytics hub that we discussed um i think this gives you yeah quite quite sort of holistic view of um of different competitors so that you can benchmark them against each other with against lots of different metrics to be honest that's really helpful uh, thank you very much yeah no problem excellent thanks guys any more questions yes can i ask one yeah yep yeah, go for it ken so the the quantity surveyor or cost consultant often compiles the final scores and i and i wonder whether you um looked at how the contractors did on bidding towards the QS consultant instead of towards the end user client, because I think the, the QS consultant often uh, sort of has the overriding vote, sometimes even over the client's preference or the architect's preference. Right. Yeah. No, we didn't really do it from that perspective. We looked, we did it from the client really, but I, I see what you mean. I think it's probably sort of a natural way for us to progress the, uh, the solution as well, Ken. And thought about it from that step. point of view. Awesome. Thanks so much, Yoshi. Cheers everyone. Yep. Thanks guys. Yeah. Thanks for listening everyone.